Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. You seem fixated on the beautiful woman in the striking little black dress flirting with that very handsome and polished looking young man by the fireplace. She always looked good, but tonight she looked equal parts goddess and sensuality. She should. She bought the black Dolce and Gabbana satin bustier cocktail dress just for this occasion. The same with the Manolo Blahnik Nadia jeweled satin 90mm pumps adorning her feet. They made her almost six feet tall. Her Victoria's Secret lingerie and stocking set and Tiffany glittering diamond earrings completed her look. It took her over three hours and several thousand dollars to look that perfect. That's my wife, Jill. We've been married for over 25 years, and yes, she is very beautiful. I would guess, though, that she is 15 to 20 years older than him. She deflected my question by saying, I thought so. I saw you two come in together. I'm surprised. You don't seem angry at her for being so flirty? You don't seem like one of those guys who get turned on by it either, are you? No, but honestly, I'm not sure how I feel. I turned and looked at this. Well, I'm not sure how to describe her. She wasn't beautiful, more handsome if you can say that about a woman. But she is obviously well-to-do, very bright and definitely exudes sex and class from every pore of her being. There were several women at the charity function who had looks similar to hers. My immediate thought was she was a doctor or lawyer. I told her. If I'm being honest here, it does excite me a little, I guess. But you're wrong about the anger part. Right now, anger is at the top of my list. But I'm also slightly jealous and frightened too, I think. As you can see, my emotions are all over the place. It's like all of them are taking little jabs at me simultaneously, and I can't process them effectively. It's very disconcerting to say the least. It's been going on now for about 20 minutes. I'm trying to decide whether or not I should go over there and break it up. I turned back to stare at my wife and the gentleman who now had his arm around my wife's hip and was gently caressing the small of her back. She seemed not to notice and was obviously enthralled with whatever he was whispering in her ear. If I didn't know better and was seeing them for the first time, I would easily think they had been lovers for years. Every move, each touch, seemed natural and well-patterned. On the other hand, I want her to have a good time. She's earned it. She has had a rough go of it for a while now. She lost both her parents and her only sibling in the last year. Work has been very difficult for her. She is the CFO for a tech company that has been trying to recover from some very bad business decisions. They have gone through several rounds of layoffs and the stress on her has been tremendous, but with her help they have started to turn the corner. In order to handle all of her stresses, she has been on a rigorous diet and exercise program for over a year now. You seem very proud of her. I sighed gently and turned back to this study this curious woman, I am. It hasn't been easy for her. Tonight is sort of a coming out of the darkness party for her. He was fondling the silver heart-shaped pendant hanging from my wife's neck. It was the only item including her matching lingerie that wasn't specifically purchased for this evening. It was a locket with our pictures inside of it that I gave her on our first anniversary all those many years ago. It wasn't much, but we didn't have much then. She told me she loved it and 24 years later, even though she could afford much better, she still wore it every chance she got. I told her she didn't need to wear it tonight, but she said it was worth more to her than the rest of her outfit, and she wouldn't dream of not wearing it. They were both saying something obviously about it as they appeared to study it. As he turned it over, fanning great interest in its simple design, he would let the back of his hand gently caress her breasts over her gown. She responded indifferently, as if this were the most normal thing in the world. It ratcheted up my anxiety level a great deal, though. While continuing to gaze at the two lovers, I asked the woman politely, I'm sorry I didn't get your name? When I got no immediate response, I pivoted to look at her and saw that she was so mesmerized by what was occurring between the man and my wife that she apparently hadn't heard me. I took a moment to glance around the great room. It seemed no one but this woman and I had taken any notice of the couple that was the center of our attention. I quietly inquired as to her name again as I leaned in close to her ear. As the party had progressed and alcohol continued to flow freely, the noise level had gone up considerably. She seemed startled and broke her eye contact from them and turned to me. I'm sorry, I guess I was engrossed with the two loth. I mean the couple. My name is Tony, Dr. Tony Adams. She grasped my hand and made a formal show of shaking it and went back to staring at them. Jim Michaels, do you know the gentleman obviously trying to seduce my wife? I queried without breaking eye contact from them. Are you certain it is he who is doing the seducing? She said with a wry smile as we both watched my wife drape her arm over the front of his shoulder with her elbow and forearm resting on his chest as they clinked their crystal champagne glasses together in a toast of something. No, I've never seen him before. 
He is quite a handsome man though, don't you think? We continued our conversation while never breaking eye contact on the couple who were now leaning into each other in a very relaxed and familiar manner. Anyone who should take notice of them would definitely believe they had been a couple for some time. Yes, I suppose he is. I was becoming very anxious and was trying desperately to maintain a calm exterior. I'm not sure how successful I was. I was trying in a practiced manner to speak calmly and in a quiet voice as was my habit in stressful situations. It was a trait that had served me well in my profession over the years. Most people under increasing stress tend to raise their voices, make threats, or babble incoherent, incomplete, repetitive sentences. I found it advantageous to do the opposite. It tends to embarrass and confuse those in an irrational state. Of course, that was in a business environment, and this was something entirely else. We stood silently side by side watching them for a few more minutes. There was no way we could turn away. It was too provocative. If it wasn't my wife involved, I would find it fairly erotic. I had a thought and sincerely questioned Dr. Tony, are you married? What would you do in this situation if you were me? I doubtless said it too quickly for the circumstance and tried to soften my question, but she responded before I could repair it. I'm divorced over five years now. You didn't answer the second part of my question. Now it was her turn to exhale her breath, hers being much deeper than mine. She wistfully responded, If I'm being honest, I would say two things. First, I wish it was me with him instead of her. And secondly, I would tell you to do nothing. It would be pointless. Doing nothing hardly seems the right response here. Those emotions I told you about are starting to get the better of me. The two most prevalent are fear and anger. I fear I am losing my wife and I am getting increasingly angry at him. I don't think he has missed the wedding ring on my wife's finger. He can probably feel it on his shoulder right now, never mind see it. At that moment his hand slid lower on my wife's back, now gently resting at the top of her very shapely bottom as he began to guide her outside to the garden. Without comment Tony and I discreetly followed them, both of us stopping to pick up fresh glasses of a fairly decent sparkling wine before heading outside too. As they passed by the brightly lit doorway into the dark, outside it was self-evident why she was enamored of him. His tuxedo, probably one of several Emporio Armanis he owned hung perfectly on a well-toned frame. My tux was rented from J.C. Penney. He was definitely sporting a Rolex, Tag Heuer would be beneath him. I involuntarily pulled my sleeve over my $59 wristwatch I bought on Amazon. I'm betting it had the exact time on it that the man's Rolex did. He was probably 6 feet 2 inches or so without an ounce of fat anywhere. He had long, wavy, sandy-colored hair like a California surfer dude type, but his face and jawline were tight and rugged. He looked like he just jumped out of a GQ cover photo. I felt a hand slip around my elbow and pull me in the opposite direction. Let's sit here and talk a bit, whispered Tony, and she pointed to a table out of the direct light. It was probably as discreet a location we would find with approximately a hundred or so party guests milling about. I noted though that Mr. GQ had conducted my wife to a dark corner that offered much more privacy from the throng. When we situated ourselves at the ornamental iron cafe table, we could still maintain our view of the couple. He chose that exact moment to boldly clutch my wife to him and kiss her full on her lips. Long and hard. She responded by placing both arms around his neck as she almost collapsed into him and returned it with a passion she had never given me. I started to jump up but felt Tony pull me back down. Jim, don't. Please don't make a scene. It will only make matters worse. Think for a moment. I was starting to lose it and was getting ready to tell her to screw off and go in this affair when I saw a terrible sadness in her eyes that were glassy with tears. Tony, what aren't you telling me? It was more of a demand than a question. I was torn between choking Tony and trying to keep an eye on Jill and the shithead so they couldn't sneak out. Tony must have read my mind. Jim, you don't have to watch them. They won't sneak out. They will come to you. Kyle will make Jill tell you what they are going to do before he will leave with her. It is part of his thing. He gets off on the humiliation of the husband. He will look you directly in the eyes as Jill tells you she is going to spend the weekend with him. How do you know all this? How can you? Wait, you were with him, weren't you? That's why you were divorced. Tell me who that a-hole is and what is going on or so help me. My full attention was now on Tony. Talk to me, you witch. A frightened Dr. Adams spoke quickly. His name is Kyle Rittenhouse. He is extremely wealthy, although no one seems to know where his money comes from. Despite his frequent cucking of married men at these events, he is always invited because he donates large sums to the various charities involved. So, the Foundation's members just overlook it. I glanced quickly around the patio. 
A few minutes ago, no one even noticed us, but now it seemed if everyone was watching. I guess the death of my marriage was tonight's entertainment. So that's what happened with you. I felt sick to my stomach, like a solid punch had just been delivered to my solar plexus. Just tell me, please. She was very emotional and hesitated frequently in telling her story. It was a very similar event, and I was here with my husband of 18 years. We have three kids they barely speak with me today. I don't even know where my ex-husband is. I haven't talked with him in several years. Her tears were falling easily now. Tony, please, I'm sorry about your family, but just tell me what happened. Exactly what you were seeing going on with your wife. My husband Tom and I attended a fundraising event to upgrade our hospital's cardiology and vascular lab with state-of-the-art EKG and other machines as well as the latest implantable cardioverter defibrillators and other equipment. I hadn't been at the function more than 15 minutes when Rittenhouse set his sights on me. It seemed like a few minutes later I was standing in front of my husband and some other invited dignitaries telling him I was leaving with Kyle. It really was a couple of hours, I'm sure. She broke down again. I looked right at the love of my life, the father of my three young teenage children, and told him I was going to spend the weekend with Kyle. I knew my marriage was over when I saw the shocked look quickly turn to anger on his face, but I was going anyway. Tom started to get up into Kyle's face, but a couple of the organizer's security team had appeared out of nowhere and physically convinced him to sit back down. I turned and walked away from his pleading voice telling me to stop, but I didn't. Kyle was smiling the whole time with his arm around my waist as we left. Jesus. It gets worse, Jim. You need to brace yourself for this part. It was by far the best sexual experience of my life. It was unworldly. And despite everything I lost, if Kyle asked me to go with him again, I would. The hell with this shit. I'm going over there right now and put a stop to it. Don't do it, Jim. All you will do is embarrass yourself. Look around you. Everyone knows what is coming, and they are all watching you. The Foundation security is already heading over to us. Besides, Kyle and your wife are coming our direction right now anyway. She is going to go with him no matter what you do or say. I looked behind me and sure enough that shithead Kyle had his arm around my wife's waist, her ass really, guiding her to me. He had a smirk on his face that no one could miss, and he never changed his expression or broke eye contact with me. My wife at least had the decency to look away when she saw my disposition. In that instant, I knew two things. First, my marriage was over. No matter what happened in the next five minutes, we were done. Secondly, I wasn't going to play the helpless victim and be the evening's floor show. I wasn't going to give them the satisfaction. I turned back to Tony before they arrived to be greeted with the look of a woman who clearly was in lust with Rittenhouse. Shit, if he asked her, she would probably have sex with him on the table right now. Damn it. All of a sudden, a large cocktail party that was very boisterous 30 seconds ago got deathly quiet as I started to try to engage Tony in a conversation. From behind me came, Jim, honey, I want you to meet someone. Her voice was cracking as she said it. I guess shitting all over a 25-year marriage is stressful. I didn't even turn around. I ignored her completely. I asked a shocked Dr. Adams to tell me about her children. Her mouth dropped open. She tried to recover and speak, but only emitted a couple of squeaks. Much louder this time. Jim, I want you to meet someone. This time with surprise and embarrassment in her voice. Still looking at Dr. Adams and waiting for her response, I continued to disregard them both. Then the shithead Rittenhouse interrupted, Excuse me, Mr. Michaels. You really need to listen to what your wife has to say, his voice laden with mockery. I didn't react to him, and I repeated my question to Tony. I really want to hear about your children? Not only was the room silent, but everyone seemed frozen in their places. Tony was regaining her wits, but before she could speak, we were disrupted again. Jim, please turn around and look at me? My wife implored. I couldn't decide if she was exasperated or aggravated. I turned slowly and glanced at them both for a moment. They were becoming aware of the scene they were causing, and their discomfort was rising. Honey, this is... I interrupted pointedly and spoke forcefully while my eyes bore into hers. Jill, you have never looked more beautiful than tonight. You are truly a vision. Her face lit up, she began to smile and speak, but I broke in. Goodbye, Jill. And I turned back to my table mate. You were saying Tony? People were beginning to titter and laugh nervously at the unfolding standoff. I could sense the two lovebirds' embarrassment growing. Tony started to speak of her three children in a light manner, which caused even more reaction from the gathered crowd. Then Rittenhouse made an almost fatal mistake. He put his hand on my shoulder and tried to pull me in his direction. Tony knew instantly what was going to happen, so trying to avoid disaster, she asked in a loud voice, Kyle, why don't you go home with me instead of her? 
You won't be sorry. Kyle removed his hand from my shoulder and asked politely, Do we know each other, madam? At that moment, I saw an expression of utter dejection on Tony's face. She had sacrificed her family and dignity to someone who didn't even remember her. I can't recall seeing someone in so much pain. What she had done was finally hitting home, and life was seeping out of her rapidly like air from a punctured balloon. There was something else that flitted across her face. I became genuinely concerned for her welfare. It was time to end this circus. I turned back to Jill and Rittenhouse. I'm sorry, I didn't realize you were still here. You may go now, and I waved them away with my hand. I always wanted to use Val Kilmer's line from Tombstone. It only took the end of my marriage to do it. I vaguely heard my wife say, we'll talk when I get home Sunday night. They turned and left without further comment, but it was obvious that Mr. Rittenhouse was not a happy man. His perfectly structured cheekbones were beat red with embarrassment. It wasn't much, but it was a small victory. Looking around the patio, I can see that the attendees were disappointed that there wasn't more of a show. Sorry to disappoint. Maybe next time, folks. I thought to myself. The two beefy security guys gave short laughs as they turned and walked away. Tony having somewhat recovered offered, she thinks you will get past this. No, she couldn't possibly. She has to know she just ended our marriage and she is going with him anyway. You were right about everything. I felt melancholy. Thank you for trying. But I have to know, did you do that for me or you? Neither. I tried to do it for your wife. I have lived for the past five years with the emotional turmoil and pain she is going to experience. Something was already dead inside of Dr. Adams and it shook me to my core. Dr. Adams, Tony, I know what you are thinking right now. Please don't do it. It isn't worth it. What are you talking about, Jim? Don't play games with me. Look me in my eyes and tell me you aren't thinking about harming yourself. Funny, my thoughts weren't with my wife for marriage, but I was deeply troubled that Dr. Adams was possibly going to end her misery and do so tonight. She couldn't look at me. She just dropped her head and wept. All right, Doc, you have three choices. You and I can sit here all night long and talk. We can go to a 24-hour coffee shop and speak there, or I can take you home. What's it going to be? She gave a little snort. You aren't that great a conversationalist. You may as well just take me home. Still quick with a sharp wood even in the face of all this. I was starting to like Dr. Adams. We drove the 35 minutes to her apartment in silence. Each of us lost in our own thoughts. I did keep looking over at her, and even in the darkness could tell she was having bad thoughts. Most people who commit suicide don't want to die any more than anyone else. They just have acceptance that there is nothing else to live for and their desire to stop their pain is stronger than their fear of death. And Dr. Adams, like most medical professionals, had little fear of death anyway. They saw it every day. Doctors and nurses understand that no matter how much physical or mental pain someone is in at the moment of the cessation of their life, you can observe the agonizing scars of age, disease and pain disappear and the deceased would have an indescribable look of peace. All the age lines and crevices of ache and suffering disappear. Their eyes long dulled by aging are alive and bright, and for a moment they look young again. Many who have been too long in the field and have seen too much are envious of the dying. Of course, it only lasts a moment before the physiological process of death takes over, but it is the last moment that one remembers. For medical personnel and others such as military and first responders, it must sometimes seem tempting. I had lost my wife, but I wasn't going to lose Dr. Tony Adams. The irony wasn't lost on me. When we arrived at her apartment, I escorted her to the door, took her keys from her, unlocked it, and followed her inside. Thank you, Jim. I can get myself to bed. What are you doing? I was taking off my jacket and tie followed by kicking off my shoes. I'm not leaving you alone tonight. I will sleep here on the couch, but I am not going to leave you until I know you are going to be okay. You are too important. Don't even think about arguing. And I plopped myself down on the couch and watched her. She just stared back at me for a few moments, then without a word turned and walked into her bedroom. I looked around the apartment. It was pretty stark for a woman's home. There was not a single family photo or memory to be seen anywhere. Not a good sign. Five minutes later, she came back out wrapped in a fluffy blue and white robe. She went to the kitchenette and poured us a couple of glasses from a previously opened bottle of red wine. She came into the living room and sat down on the couch next to me. She once again had tears in her eyes, but they were of a different kind. They were tears of gratitude. Okay, Jim, let's talk. Sometimes it doesn't take much more than caring to save someone's life. Five years later.
Today was the fifth anniversary of my divorce being finalized and coincidentally it was my first grandchild Jonathan's second birthday. Today would be the initial time Jill and I had been in the same place at the same time since I filed for divorce. That isn't completely true. We tried to be in the same room once a few months after the final decree, but it didn't go well at all. It was partially my fault. Well, admittedly, it was mostly my fault. I could have taken the high road and been an adult about it, but I was still pretty angry, so when my wife approached me to talk about it, at our daughter's graduation reception, I took the low road instead. Hello, Jim. I've missed you. When I interrupted with, Hello, Miss Brett, how are? She ran crying out of the room. If looks could kill, I would have been dead right then and there. Most of the family members and attendants were shooting daggers at me. I did have to give credit to our kids, though. We raised them right, and they were smart enough not to get into the middle of our separation. But as they pointed out after the reception fiasco, I acted childishly. They did, however, have the good sense to decide that there would be no further attempts at having the two of us at the same family function. Well, what did they expect? Our divorce was pretty acrimonious. I can't take all the credit for that because even though I was angry and wanted my pound of flesh, my wife fought the divorce in every way she could, which I wasn't exactly sure how you did that in a no-fault environment. I think her strategy was to utilize every delaying tactic possible to make the divorce so expensive I would give it up. Having money, though, is one of the few downsides in a divorce. It can go on for quite a while and lawyers get paid regardless. In any case, I wasn't giving it up. But Dr. Adams had been right again. Jill thought I would get past her little weekend fling. I wondered if she tried the same tactics during her divorce. I never asked her, though. Jill also somehow got the family law judge to order mandatory counseling. I suppose it wasn't really mandatory, but when the judge looks at you and says, Mr. Michaels, while I can't order counseling because there are no minor children involved, are you really saying that you can't do a few weeks of counseling to try and save a 25-year relationship? What are you supposed to do? We agreed. I mean to say the lawyers agreed on 12 sessions, but after the third one both my wife and the assigned counselor knew it was hopeless and we all agreed to call it off. As I remember it my wife ran out the room crying then too. I think the consensus was reached after I said something like, Do you really believe I'm going to stay married to a 304 that wanted to introduce me to her boyfriend so she could tell me she was going to have sex with him all weekend long in the middle of a damn charity function with a couple hundred people watching? It was an honest question but perhaps I could have been more tactful. It did get my point across, though. I did get the last laugh, too. After her counseling gambit, I had my very eager young heavily saddled with tuition debt lawyer amend the divorce petition to include spousal support for me. You see, my wife's total income package was more than twice mine, and after 25 years, I had the right to a portion of it. Something about in a manner accustomed to? I didn't really need it as we were both able to provide for ourselves comfortably enough, but it was the principle of it right? Although not nearly what I demanded, I did get a nominal amount mostly because her legal team told her what might happen with her investments, retirement, profit sharing, etc. if we didn't have an agreement in place beforehand. She conceded to the support and I knew it galled her because our finances were always separate. I was happy. The money I put into a savings account for any future grandchildren. But the thing I was most happy about was, as part of the final decree that we had agreed to in the settlement, she was supposed to retake her maiden name back as her legal name. I wanted to be completely done with her. I know I should have just done a simple split and moved on, but the pain and humiliation for the unmerciful way she destroyed my esteem made me feel justified. Now five years later my anger had abetted and I agreed with my son that his expectation that both his parents could act like adults at our grandchild's birthday party wasn't unreasonable. Plus, he said the entire family was fed up with having to coordinate things so the infantile exes didn't have to see each other. He was being polite, because everyone really meant it was just me that was being infantile. I was always proud of him, and I think a father is most proud of his children when he is confronted with the truth and recognizes that his child is correct and he is wrong. I don't know if the same is true for mothers. So that brings us to today, as I am standing in my son's expansive backyard already filled with entertainment devices that not a two-year-old could possibly master. But it is an exceptionally good family yard. For some reason it gives me feelings of hope. I have a light beer in my hand waiting for my ex to make her appearance. I had gone for a double scotch on the rocks, but my daughter-in-law gave me the stink I so I settled for the beer. Again, based on what was to come it was probably a better choice. Maybe Jill will chicken out? That's doubtful because she has wanted to talk for years. Interestingly, I don't feel any of the anxiety and anger I've felt in the past when I thought of her. Maybe it was time.
As I was reveling in the backyard's ambience, I saw her come in. She still looked beautiful. My heart didn't skip a beat or anything, but I did smile involuntarily. I quickly looked around embarrassed to see if anyone saw my expression. She seemed a little nervous, but nevertheless made her rounds to the family and spent some time on one knee talking to the birthday boy. I couldn't tell if she had seen me yet, but I assumed not. So, I just kept to myself staring at something resembling a jungle gym. The only thing was it looked way too safe for a boy to be interested in playing on it. Nearing the end of my inspection, I was disappointed to conclude that there was not even one single way for a kid to injure themselves on it. I heard her voice. Hello, Jim. How have you been? I turned to her. Yes, she definitely looked good. I stared at the Manhattan, her favorite drink, in her hand. It wasn't even in a coupe, but a tall bar glass. They made me get a light beer as I lifted my bottle into her field of vision. Oh well, I sighed. I've been good, Jill. There was a bit of an uncomfortable pause then for some reason I blurted out. You never had your name changed back like you agreed to? Surprisingly, she didn't burst into tears and run out of the party. She merely responded calmly. So, sue me. It's not like you haven't done it before. I didn't have it changed because I still consider you my husband even if in your eyes and the laws I'm not. I couldn't help myself. I had to laugh. She used to make me do that a lot. Okay, Jill Michaels it is then. You know I have been keeping tabs on you. She offered unapologetically. That raised my eyebrows and my hackles. No, I didn't know that. I snapped at her. She waved me off with a brush of her hand. Oh, don't worry it's not anything sub Rosa. I met your friend Dr. Adams. We have talked quite a bit the last couple of years or so. Actually, we've developed a bit of a bond. It might be too soon to say we are friends, but I think we are good for each other. I was beginning to believe our meeting today may have been a very poor idea. She noticed my expression. Please don't be angry with her. I begged her not to tell you. I know you two are good friends, and I didn't want to ruin that. I just wanted to try to understand how I could have done what I did to you to us. Honestly, we don't even discuss you. We are just trying to help each other. She expressed sincerely. Wow, weird I should be very upset, but I'm not. I thought. I'm not angry with you, Jill. Have you two made any progress in your understanding? I quizzed without a trace of rancor. Some, but it is a work in progress. She is quite a woman. She told me that you saved her life. No, I didn't. She saved herself. I just provided the opportunity for her to do so. I can't believe I'm saying this, but I am truly interested in understanding more about what happened. Or more accurately, why. I surprised even myself with how calm I was. Would you like to sit down and talk some? Jill had to choke back her emotions. Yes, Jim, I would very much like to talk about it. We found an unoccupied table as far from the crowd as we could and sat facing each other. Before we start, Jill, just promise me no matter what, you won't lie to me. We have too much of a history together and we're too old to play any more games. If you ever had any love, any respect, any feelings for me at all, just please don't lie to me. She was already crying. It seems that if there is one thing I am good at, it is making women cry. She nodded her head definitively and spoke softly, I promise. She pulled out a handkerchief, wiped her eyes, and blew her nose. Not very ladylike, and it drew attention from the gathered partiers. I couldn't help it. I smiled at her. You know, the handkerchief thing always bothered me. Even when we first met, I thought. Here was this beautiful, self-confident young woman, a woman who knew what she wanted in life. She was so gorgeous, charming, and feminine. You were always an attention-getter from both sexes. You were so special and yet you blew your nose like a cigar-chomping fat middle-aged truck driver in a restroom at the local truck stop. Some things never change, I guess. We both cracked up and laughed uncontrollable for about five minutes. I'm sure the family went from being worried we would kill each other to thinking we were crazy almost instantly. But it did break the ice for us. When we had finally calmed, Jill went first. Jim, I don't want to pry into your personal life, but Tony is very fond of you. She's quite attached and it makes me jealous. I know I don't have the right to feel that way, but I do. She was nervous but not being accusatory. How come you never married her? My instinct was to respond with something along the lines of, none of your damn business, but instead I opted for sincerity and openness with the understanding that it was past time to do so. Jill, Tony and I are really good friends. We do a lot of couples things together and she gives me peace and comfort. Believe it or not, but in the five years I have known her we have been intimate less than a handful of times. That's not what our relationship is about. I will never ask her to marry me, partly because I don't want to risk ruining a beautiful friendship, but mostly because of what she did. I hoped I wasn't hurting Jill, but I had to be truthful. 
I was destroyed by what you did to me. Tony told me that evening and a couple of times since that if that piece of crap asked her to, despite everything that she suffered, she would have sex with him on the 50-yard line during halftime at the Super Bowl. I can't risk having that happen to me again. I just can't. I hesitated unsure of the impact my words were having on her. I continued. You probably don't know it. Our kids certainly don't. Nor will they ever. But I went through two years of therapy trying to understand what happened to me that evening. I know I reacted calmly and as if I was in control. But in reality, I was devastated. Did Tony tell you how often Loverboy pulled that stunt and the Foundation's reaction to it? Yes. But Jim, I never fooled myself. Even while I was standing there with him falling under his spell, I understood what the reality was. He didn't get me into his bed by telling me lies, in which he had found his soulmate in me. He never said it's our destiny to be together for the rest of our lives and travel the world in luxury. He simply told me that if I spent the weekend with him, he would promise me the best sex of my life. He told me that when I drew my last breath on earth, our weekend together would be foremost on my mind. That's all, and for some reason, even five years of therapy haven't provided me an answer for. I agreed to it. Well, was it? Was it the best sex of your life? This was a moment of truth. Jill never even hesitated. There would be no more lies, at least from her. Yes, Jim, it was. I know that hurts you, and I'm terribly sorry, but I won't lie to you ever again. The truth of the matter is, nothing can compare to it, and before you ask, I would like to think if he came for me again I would say no, but I couldn't promise that to you. In fact, I spent the next several months after I knew you were gone and not coming back looking for the deep sensual emotion I had discovered that weekend. I'm afraid I did some shameful things. Tony, who did the same, called it the search for the endless orgasm. Thank you for being honest. It does hurt, but I think a lie right now would have hurt more. I have another hard question for you. Candidly, Jill, over the years I have actually come to understand why you might have wanted to go with Rittenhouse. Tony and I have discussed her reasoning or lack thereof for her actions. I think I have gotten past that part and maybe if that is all there was to it, we could have worked our way through it somehow. God, I know. Tony told me about your feelings about what was happening earlier in the party. I am so ass. I put my hand up with the international symbol for stop. What I will never be able to get past. And honestly, the reason we will never get back together is the way you did it. Oh, I understand why the shithead told you to do it that way. He got off on the humiliation factor for the poor sap of a husband. But how could you walk up to your devoted and loving husband of 25 years, the father of your children, the man who celebrated every success with you, the man who held you and wept with you at every failure and pain you ever felt in your adult life and in a public setting and tell me you were going to take a lover and screw each other's brains out all weekend long, then return to me and expect to have our life go on as if nothing of significance had occurred? Now I was the one close to tears. What possessed you? You couldn't even discreetly come to me alone and talk about it private. She stood silent and frozen for a full minute. She didn't cry though. Maybe she didn't have any tears left. I don't know, Jim. I honestly don't know. I could give you all the standard crap about me being worried about growing old, you neglecting me, hormone imbalances, etc. But none of that bullshit was true. That's what is killing me. Five years later, and I don't know how I could do that to you. He simply told me that was the way we had to do it that it would be best for everyone, so I did it. When he said it, it just made sense. So that's what I did. I knew I was hurting you, but I honestly thought we could work past it. When he took me home that Sunday night, and yes, he took me home. He was a perfect gentleman, but he ended it by literally flipping on a light switch in his suite and told me that it was time for him to get me home. Before I got out of the car in front of our house, he thanked me for a great time and kissed me on the cheek and it was over and done. That's how I felt too. It was over. When I came home, I honestly thought you would be waiting for me. When I realized you were gone, I actually got angry with you for running out on me. Can you believe that? It's why I fought the divorce so hard. I was going to make you pay. Nice touch on the alimony thing, by the way. I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. Jill, you aren't some high school dropouts living in a single wide trailer working part-time at King Super. You have an advanced finance degree and practically run a Fortune 500 company for Christ's sake. She didn't answer. There was no fight left in her. She was exposed, no part of her hidden from me. I have never seen her look so vulnerable. The answers to my questions might never come because she truly didn't know them. How is that even possible? What do you want from me, Jill? She was almost begging. Jim, I want you to save me too. You did it for Tony and she did the same thing as I did. And you were with her. I just want to be back in your life. 
I can accept us never being married again even living together, but I can't live with you not being in my life. It's killing me that I'm made as strangers. Up until today, I would have snapped out the obvious response. Because I was never married to her. But I decided to remain silent. I had no idea how long we had been sitting and talking. I looked around the backyard, and we were the only ones left. The sun was starting to set to the west. I briefly thought, the party is either over, or we scared everyone inside? Jill seemed not to notice. She was still lost in her thoughts about the choices she had made. What did I want? That was the most prevalent thought on my mind. I had been asked several times over the years by well-meaning friends and family, not to mention my counselors, are you better off with her in your life or out of it? My resounding response has always been, out of it. But now I'm not so sure. The truth is I miss her. I miss holding each other in bed, winding down as we would talk about our days and our children. I miss laughing together at life's comedy going on around us. I miss the smell of her perfume. I miss seeing her naked wearing only that silly locket. I miss everything. We were perfect once. It would never be again, but then life lived in absolutes is a life wasted. I can do friends, Jill. Why don't we make a standing date to have dinner once or twice a month? I think we still have a lot to think and talk about. Well, I'll be damned. She did have some tears left in her. Why did I never go after Kyle Rittenhouse? Well, he was partially to be blamed for my wife's actions, but it was my wife who was the real culprit here. What happened to him, you may ask? His bodyguard beat him to a pulp when he pulled the same act on him. In fact, he was beaten by both his guards so bad that he may never be able to be with any woman, let alone promise her the famed amazing one night. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section below and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.